Hello, everyone. My name is Elena Machado, and um, I'm based at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And I will speak on behalf of a group of people. I'm the PI of this project called Exchange, which is about the transnational exchange of DNA data in the European Union for the purpose of fighting crime, terrorism, and the so-called illegal migration. And uh, today I will talk about performativity of data in criminal DNA databases and the construction of categories of suspicion. And I will begin with a story, a story of a criminal case that is being told to be a successful story. So on May 21st, 1, 2015, an elderly couple were found dead and raped in their home in the city of Vienna, Vienna in Austria. Although the Austrian police found the alleged killer's DNA, no DNA matches were identified in the National Austrian DNA database. However, under a transnational agreement on DNA data exchange among European Union countries, the Dutch DNA database offer a DNA match uh, for a, a 20 years old Polish man. The Austrian authorities began looking for him and the suspect was arrested in Dusseldorf, Germany on June 2016. There was a suspicion that this man might have committed violent crimes in other European countries. And therefore, the authorities of other EU countries, namely the UK, Sweden, and Germany, started looking for matches in the Polish DNA database to DNA stains from solved crimes that were stored in their respective uh, national criminal DNA databases. The matches in this criminal case were produced in the, so, in the context of the so-called PRUM system. PRUM is the name of a, a very small German town, where in 2005, the ministries of five countries in Europe signed a, a, a treaty for cooperation for fighting uh, criminality. So this is a transnational system of surveillance and identification designed to govern some of the most contentious and high profile issues in current uh, European politics, cross-border cross crime, terrorism, and illegal migration. And so this pan-European network was created to exchange data pertaining to DNA profiles, fingerprints, and uh, motor vehicle information stored in different criminal databases uh, of different uh, countries. Um, and for the purpose of this paper, I will only focus uh, on the narratives of people who are in charge of operating the system uh, we have been conducting interviews so far uh, in uh, um, 18 countries, different 18 countries. And uh, I will explore the performativity of data flows in criminal DNA databases and how these uh, people uh, construct categories of suspicion. So I will explore the meanings that they attribute to the exchange of data. And the criminal case that uh, I just told you provides several interesting clues for understanding this performativity of data. Uh, first, the hero of the story is the DNA match. Second, the villain of the story is a man coming from an Eastern European country, a former communist country. Moving, a person who is moving around Europe, 
and potentially committing crimes in different countries. And third, the story ends with the promise that crimes committed by transnational criminals might be worked out by transnational cooperation. Um, building on insights from the literature on surveillance and social studies of science and technology, um, I make the use of the notion of performativity, and such approach, approach is meant to work that governance of criminality through the circulation of DNA profiles between different countries performs materiality, meaning, and morality. And in the specific case of the PRIM system, addressing data as performative means to take into account that forms of subjectivation, in this case criminalization, do not only depend on the actual information provided by the data, but on the larger social and political settings. In other words, the exchange of DNA data is entangled with the production of particular sets of suspects. Europe is gradually transforming into a digital and selective border machine. And the narratives of the forensic experts who operate the PRIM system highlight an ambivalence between, on the one hand, the celebration of a European society that facilitates movement and promotes the idea of no borders, and on the other hand, the increasing attempts to restrict and monitor the mobility of the people deemed problematic. So as one of the experts was saying, we are, we are just getting globalized. In terms of fighting crime, the freer the movement of people, the harder things can get. So the starting point of the worries of the anxieties is mobility. And in this sense, the prim system is seen as a possibility to control these potential dangerous citizens on the move. As one of them said, prim give, gives us the opportunity to catch that guy who can travel freely in all Europe. Um, uh, of course, this discourse is based on neutrality. DNA profiles are just a string of numbers, as these forensic experts presented. And the PRIM system is based on two steps. The first step consists on automatic exchange of DNA profiles uh, 24 hours a day. And the second step on the circulation of further personal information through mutual assistance procedures. This means that when a DNA match occurs, country A will requ request country B to send uh, more data regarding that uh, DNA match. And according to our interviews, the first step of exchanging data is characterized by neutrality due to the use of impersonal numbers. So in the first step, as one of them said, you only compare DNA profiles. And DNA profiles are only 20 or 30 numbers. There is nothing you can tell about the owner of the DNA profile from the DNA profile itself. So, what, uh, sorry, um, how do I go back? Well, anyway, when in the first moment DNA profiles are automatically exchanged between countries, we can see an operation that resonates with uh, some authors, namely Agerty and Erickson, described as the surveillance assemblage, which, which operates by abstracting human bodies from their territorial settings and separating them into discrete flows. And in this sense, criminality is deterioralized. However, Haydn, in the seeming 
neutrality of codes and numbers and standards, DNA also plays a constitutive role of forms of criminalization, and I will uh, show how that operates. Um, the second step of PRIM, so the exchange of data related to the DNA matches, becomes personalized and territorialized. Inasmuch as the type of crime and the name of other and other personal data are disclosed. And this implies making decisions. So what sort of matches are we going to follow? Because we don't have the resources or the time to follow every matches. And what supports that kind of decision? In other words, what are the matches that are worthy? following. Cho choosing which DNA matches should be followed up and which ones are not operate along specific notions of suspect populations. Um, and I will show some quotes that illustrate how these decisions are made. Upon the request of country A to obtain more information about the DNA hit, uh, country B, who receives the request, will decide to give or not to give more information. And in the interviews, different uh, positions emerge in these regards. And the main difference is in countries in which the criminal DNA database is on the hands of the police, we decide to send all the information for investigation purposes, everything which is important to pursue a criminal investigation. There are no obstacles to share. While in countries where the criminal DNA database is, is on the ends of the judiciary, uh, there is the selection, according to these narratives, of which data can be shared, and it is according to the law. So we have also this quote, uh, when the DNA database is a police DNA database, they would like to have all the information like this immediately. And we have to say, I'm sorry, I cannot give this information. Um, so how does it work in practice? What data travels within PRIM? Uh, we have this sort of decision, local decision, of what is data which, uh, in which the owner is a um, national state and which is data that we can provide to externals. Uh, for instance, in this quote, uh, the person being interviewed uh, referred that we have race and there is no special limit for the kind of data that we hold in criminal DNA databases. But when we have to share with other countries, uh, we have a strict list of data that we can provide them. And in most cases, it will be uh, the name, date of birth, and gender. But on a, a local level, they will have all the information possible. So who are the suspects? One of the most prominent one is a foreigner from Eastern Europe countries, from former communist countries. And we have in most of the, the, the quotes, uh, in most of the interviews, um, sentences like this one. Criminals from Eastern, East European countries, networks implemented in those countries. Uh, but uh, an, uh, there are other versions are of Europe risky others, and one of them is asylum seekers coming from African countries. As this person says, very often the asylum seekers will be criminals. They will be fingerprinted, we will collect a DNA sample, and so on. For instance, when a man declares he is from Morocco, claiming 
Morocco forced me because of my political ideas. However, he is a criminal. Um, so, uh, also ethnic communities, and in some quotes they will say um, with, more, with more precision, Roma people. Uh, and also the drug criminals, and uh, who are typically framed as people coming from African countries uh, that will move very fast in more uh, central uh, European countries. So, in conclusion, um, Prum, this network of exchanging DNA data should be located in a wider account of changing dynamics of technology, geopolitics, and criminalization. In particular, it highlights contemporary projects to know and govern mobile bodies. Criminalization takes place through the production and use of data, in particular by managing several decisions related to data exchange. And this paper used the example of Europe to highlight how national and supranational levels, notions of cross-border crime and suspect individuals and social groups, and of national ownership of data and other, form, other forms of political subjectivity are expressed through socio-technical systems of government. Thank you. Thanks for coming, except the person here. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about a completely different subject, which is video games. Uh, but if there's some similar questions that are raised, so maybe for the discussion it could be a, a good point of uh, a meeting point, in fact. So uh, if some of you that were at the presentation this morning from uh, Jennifer Whitson, we were talking about uh, the video game industry, uh, why there's more and more uh, data that is being collected from the players. So uh, surveillance is being uh, implemented within the games, within the consoles as well. As well, and we're seeing more and more jobs uh, created for these companies, such as data scientists, data analysts, which are going to produce meaning or which are, are going to analyze this data that, that is being produced. And for those that know uh, Pokemon Go, which is a pretty good example, where you're uh, geolocated <coughs> while you're playing, well, this data is collected for, by the company. Uh, as well, uh, you see the controller here. Uh, if you play PlayStation 4, you can stream your uh, play uh, session live. So this data as well is stocked somewhere. So these are a few examples of uh, the type of data that could be collected. Uh, another example is uh, all these st statistics about uh, daily active users. So the number of, of players that are in your game every day. Uh, the number of returning players, which is really important for these companies because they understand if players are coming back after a first experience, so they, they understand if they can retain their, their, uh, their cons consumers. So uh, there's different types of, different ways of implementing uh, surveillance uh, strategies within the games and the consoles. And ultimately the, the objectives of these companies, and it's mainly uh, mainstream companies, so the more commercial as uh, aspect of the industry, that I'm, I'm talking about here. Uh, the objectives are really to uh, improve the experiences of their players, but ultimately it's really to increase profit profitability, uh, to shape the development of their future games, so if they see that they've made some errors with their actual game, then they can see the data and try to uh, give a better version afterwards. And also to predict and understand the behaviors of the players, which we're gonna talk more in uh, detail afterwards. So from this uh, context, uh, our main questions uh, that we raised were how can we question big data tools and discourses through an empirical research and how can we question the truth value associated with data? And these questions were raised from a research we've done in 2000, 2000, 2013 and 2015. Uh, the, the main objective of this research wasn't uh, the, the two questions I've just uh, talked to you about, but uh, mainly what we're trying to do with this with this research was to study a gaming community uh, to see how this community uh, defines its digital uh, identity. How do they construct their identity uh, through their avatar, so how they play in the game, through their Facebook account because it's a Facebook game, and also through the forums, so how they discuss about the game online. So this was our main research, but from this research 
we, we, there are some que questions that emerged, such as how, what's the truth value of this data? How can we question the use of this, these big data tools? And so just to uh, show you the game uh, quickly, uh, the game is called Big Story, Little Heroes. You can see the banner here. Uh, it was created in 2012 by Vendel Games, which is an independent company from Montreal. Uh, it is a Facebook game, one of the first real-time Facebook games that were created. So you play in real time with other players. And the, the aim of the, of the game is to capture the flag from the enemy. You can kill them. It's really classic and you can level up. You have different uh, heroes you can choose. So here it's uh, pretty blurry, but you can see that uh, players are trying to go collect the statue and bring it back, but it's a really typical, uh, typical game. Uh, so our methodology for this research was, we had two aspects, in fact, we had the quantitative, quantitative side and the qualitative side. Uh, for the quantitative, we, were, we had access to databases from the, the, the game company that they gave us, in fact. And this, these databases were giving us information on gamer characteristics such as the age, gender, and uh, the country of the, of the person. Also actions, avatars, and match information was one database, which was uh, information about uh, number of kills, number of deaths, uh, the heroes that were chosen, the, the match information, which is more how many matches did you win, did you lose, so really uh, basic information. and. Uh, we used a SQL request to uh, question this data, and we also used the tool Rapid Miner to uh, clean the data, uh, create different requests, and correlate the different databases together. For the qualitative side, and I'm just going to go quickly with uh, this aspect. This was mainly my uh, my uh, what I I was doing in this research was to analyze what players were saying on the official forum of the game. So see what types of interactions they have together. What are the sentiments about uh, the game? What are the perceptions? Which which are the leaders that are in this this community? And what are the, the norms and values that are shared within this community? And how can this inform, in fact, what's happening in in the game and vice versa? So the idea of cross -re referencing was really important for us as a as an objective. So from this research, in fact, this is the like the, the object of our, our presentation today is mainly to talk about the difficulties that were or, that arose from our research and mainly about the data that was used and what it, what does it mean to use this data. So first of all, uh, one main difficulty is the fact that it's a company uh, working with ac academics. So we have different languages, different methods, different objectives, and it's really it was really important for us to maintain a certain independence since. We cannot uh, comply to what the company is trying to do, which is mainly to monetize, retain their players. Uh, we have our own objectives, so we had to maintain this independence. But at the same time, we are always dependent from what the company is giving us, such as access to databases, what is being tracked. Uh, in fact, just to uh, pre precise here, is that we weren't there at the inception of the game. So we arrived later when the game was already uh, on the market. So we couldn't put our own trackers in the game to, uh, to uh, follow which uh, behaviors we wanted to, uh, to analyze. So we had to do with what the company was giving us. Also the attributes, uh, the terminology of the attributes that we're, uh, we're analyzing can be uh, difficult for us to understand if there's not a literature that the company has created themselves. And sometimes for them it's really evident what it means, but it's, it's a really a different language such as, for example, the gender. They had a, an attribute which was gender, and it was the gender of the avatar in the game and not the gender of the person on Facebook, which we thought was this type of gender. So we thought, OK, it's mainly, uh, I don't know, women we're playing. or So it, it, it can skew or, or give a, like different results. And if there's not this communication, sometimes it can, be, uh, it can lead to cer certain problems. Other difficulties is uh, cleaning the data. So, uh, uh, Fabien was the main uh, uh, person uh, working on this, which is really time consuming and tedious because uh, there are different types of data that can be uh, abnormal. For example, if you have an attribute which is the number of matches that you've played in the game, it's impossible that it, it is negative. But we've seen some negative values for attributes that were not supposed to be negative. Uh, so there was these types of data that we are questioning, why is it there? And especially since it's an independent company, they're not 
their, their main focus wasn't really to create the best databases with the best attributes, which were the, which were the most clear for us. So we had to work with all of this and try to understand why were, there were these type of errors. And also the employees, uh, this is just the fact that certain employees are playing the game. They have an expertise within the game. So they can, the results for these players are, like their, their experience is greater, they have be better results in the game than the other players, but how can you di differentiate the employees from the other gamers? It's, because it's numbers, it's not really uh, easy to pinpoint these, these players. And finally, uh, familiarity with uh, BSALH, which is the name of the game. Uh, as such, a, Dimitri Williams said in 2010, for, uh, he was doing a, conducting a research on uh, World of Warcraft, I think. He says, to understand the impacts that code and culture can have, I insist that any working team have first-hand experience within the virtual world. My rule is simple, if you, if you haven't played it, you can't study it. Uh, so we played a bit of the game, <laughs> like I, I reached level five or six, I don't remember. But if you don't reach like the maximum level and you're not at, at the same level as the experts of the game, then it's difficult sometimes to create uh, some criteria to understand the behavior, such as what are the best players? So what, which criteria are you going to use to determine the best players? Is it the number of wins, the number of kills? And if you don't have the, this great experience of the game, sometimes it's difficult. So it just goes to show the difficulties that we can have with the data. And this is combined with the epistemological and ethical problems that Fagin is going to talk about uh, right now. So uh, first, my English is not as good as Patrick, but I will try to be, to be the, the best uh, co comprehensive. So I want you to talk about some uh, epistemological issues in our research. Uh, in fact, I, I want to address these issues with a uh, critical perspective. Throughout this uh, research, we have asked ourselves the questions, uh, what kind of knowledge do we produce, and what are the limitations of such knowledge? This type of question is closely linked to our activities within the research group RISC, that studies uh, big data and mobility, social network, from a socio-political uh, point of view, surveillance, uh, commoditization of the data in the era of uh, semi-capitalism. Our, our research show our research show very well that the numbers never speaks uh, for themselves. The meaning never emanates directly from the data. Of course, here I adopt uh, a perspective of uh, human science and uh, analysis of the discourse, especially in the in the field of marketing and business suffices to show the belief uh, that the data would represent the reality. It is important to say uh, that data is not reality itself, as our research uh, has shown us. We say that data is a technological representation and mediation of reality. This kind of uh, procedural uh, mediation is transmitted through uh, electronic equipment into computer language. The complexity of the player's behavior can't entirely grasp uh, with the analysis of the trace their data. We just want here emphasize uh, the naive presupposition that claim that big data can unravel a secret pattern hiding in the social field. In fact, uh, some applications are, have been able to discover and predict trends in, is in field as uh, varied as meteorology, medicine, or business. The true value uh, of the results that big data analysis tool generate is significantly higher than that of uh, other representational mode of knowledge production. The true value is even greater in the case of massive data, since the logic of big data implies that the more data is collected, the more genuine and accurate result should be. However, the intensive, inter intensive use of big data is based on the idea uh, that the world could be explained strictly in quantified patterns, because the number, the data, are objectives, free from ideology. Let us recall here the work of uh, Jacques Ellul, uh, Gilbert Simondon, or uh, Bernard Stiegler, who had dismantled the apparent neutrality of the technology. Ideology, <coughs> values, beliefs, and representation of the world are in scripts within the technology. So. Uh,
let's uh, sorry. Let's return, for example, to our research. First, is it, it is uh, important to remember that uh, database uh, study was built entirely by Vandal Games and serves the company best interest. Vandal Games used some specific tools to recall, store, and analyze data. They had chosen certain terms and definitions to name uh, the category in the database. They had an initial idea of the elements to be quantified in order to optimize the gameplay and achieve the objective acquisition, monetization, and uh, retention of players. Difficult to think of a possible naturalization of the data ID contained in the data mining formula. To recall the title of uh, a book written by Gittleman, raw data is an oxymoron. The data imposes a certain representation of the world which implies the quantification of the human life, uh, mathematization of existence, who quotes here the philosopher Eric Sadin. Uh, in uh, big stories, little heroes, the data we had access to are only the representation of certain type of information selected by the company. We analyze the data from the arbitrary and subjective choices made by the company in how to collect the data. The companies chose also, neglect, also neglected certain types of information that could have been tracked, such as data regarding friends list or uh, chat room data. The company chose to collect mainly gameplay related data Rather than, rather than that information or communication between players. The players' actions were considered to be more valuable than uh, socialization. We see here that data represents specific information selected by individual and tools depending on the technical capabilities at the time when the data is collected. Yet, tracking data and game, game player behaviors provides information that is inaccessible of the rise. Automated data collection gives us an opportunity to know exactly which functionality players select, how avatar moves, how frequently they touch us. Uh, we use uh, big data tools primarily to make correlation some, uh, between some set of data. Schomberg and QK explain that uh, the ultimate goal of big data is not look of co at causation to understand the why of a phenomenon. Rather, uh, correlations seek to explain how things work together and identify patterns that should repeat themselves. It can, te it, it can tell us what happens, <laughs> how this process unfolds, and how it will probably unfold in the future. But it cannot explain the reason why something is happening. For example, we could not explain why so, f why so few mal mal players selected female, female avatar. However, we could predict what type of player would probably choose female avatar. That's why we decided to integrate qualitative data into our research to better understand the meaning that players invest in their practice. I want to talk about um, uh, shortly about uh, another problem the, that we encountered. We question the ways in which we analyze uh, the data from an ethical perspective. While surveillance on video game platforms seems to be increasingly banalized, we have to question ourselves on the ethical limitation of our data gathering methods. Uh, you know the affirma affirmation, I have nothing to hide. Uh, Bauman and Nyon talk about liquid surveillance, uh, diffuse surveillance integrated into our daily activities. Uh, when we go on Facebook, uh, they say that we activate a mini panopticon. Anyway, how we collect data in this context? That Davis and Patterson, in their book, Ethic of Big Data, gave a list of questions that any organization of researchers collecting data should ask themselves. Are people entitled to know how their data is used in the business? Are pe people entitled to know how their data is analyzed? Are people entitled to know who within the organization has access uh, to the data? Particip par participating in, uh, in a study must be advised in order to choose whether to give, uh, to give informed consent or possibly withdraw from the study. In our research, we decided to add a notice within the game's terms and conditions section regarding the facts that in-game research was being performed. The in-game was not sensitive to players' privacy or identity. We decided to use the data, uh, and we uh, identified players by their pseudonym only. Besides, we eliminated uh, all information relative, relative to players' personal Facebook accounts. This kind of preliminary uh, question is important to address the parameters of the research, taking into account a set of norms and rules set by the researcher, especially in a context where surveillance tend to, be, tend to become uh, commonplace. So, quick conclusion. Uh, in this communication, we wanted to address 
some issues in our project to question the use of uh, big data tools, especially in the video game industry. We fo focused on the method and the problem that arose rather um, on the result than on the results. In the end, we see that the data tracked in video game depends on arbitrary choice and presupposition of the employees and the company. Uh, this type of uh, empirical research can, can inform uh, of a critical posture about the role of uh, big data in our society. Our main objective here was to question the so-called objectivity, neutrality, and veracity of data. Besides, we seek to understand uh, how can we protect privacy of the players, so it was very important to be ethical throughout the extraction and analysis of uh, data. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra Robinson, and uh, I'm a faculty member actually here at Carleton University upstairs from here in Communication and Media Studies, and I'm going to talk today about databases and doppelgangers, new articulations of power, and I think actually there's some interesting connections on the theory side between our three presentations. And in this paper, um, it's an excerpt of a, a longer article where an, an, an I examine three aspects that are relevant to the idea of data power, which of course is the notion framing our conference and within the context of our panel on data and databases. So I'll begin with a, a, a brief review of some foundational ideas that provide a little bit of background and then discuss doppelgangers, databases, and new articulations of power. And um, I will need to do a Google search of doppelgangers. You just get all these wonderful faces um, out of the Google database um, uh, that, you know, not necessarily uh, uh, doppelgangers. Um, um, now, in the early and mid-1990s, critical theorist and media scholar Mark Poster turned his analytical focus to the role of databases in contemporary culture, suggesting that the database operates as discourse because it is implicated, implicated sorry, in the construction of new subjectivities generated by profiling technologies. Now, Poster's work is an important and early critique of profiling enhanced by the expansion of the internet and digital technologies and the advanced ability to monitor consumers and practices of consumption. Information solicited from consumers in exchange for products and services being stored in greater amounts in databases and subject to analysis with increasing finesse rendering consumer subjects transparent to the scrutiny of the market. Poster in dialogue with Foucault suggests that the database operates as what he calls a super panopticon, not a term I love. But what this is is a perfect writing machine, as he calls it, that constitutes subjects as decentered from their ideologically determined unity. The postmodern subject is perpetually reconstituted by the grinding repetition of profiling apparatus that draws on a vast repository of personal information held in consumer databases to continuously recraft different consumer identities. Now, we were very privileged in Canada. We had work following on posters, work from people in Canada like Greg Elmer, Jason Pridmore, who further developed this consumer um, surveillance critique. My analysis, my analysis re-engages with poster salient critique expressed in the mode of information from 1990 and then work after that in 1996. And the power and efficacy of databases is part of contemporary information and media infrastructures. This infrastructure is the scaffold over which big data flows from the entanglement of practice, processes, and things that make up the contemporary profiling apparatus. This apparatus is a generative and dynamic assemblage, producing not only the one profiled individual, but also multiple proxies. Our light world is a datafied milieu, a cataloged and curated melange of information produced from every aspect of our life. Recent scholarship has engaged the notion of power in and through data, settling on this idea of data power, which hinges on the connection between the expanding role and influence of big data on contemporary life and its authoritative resonance as power. In this analysis, I reimagined the profile, the proxy, and the double through the figure of the doppelganger as an apt metaphor for the sometimes conflicted, fraught idea of our multiple selves. From Roger Clark's digital persona to the data doubles of the surveillance assemblage, which he referenced, or the quantified self of the self-tracking movement, the idea of our similar but fleeting other gathered from all our online traces is as unsettling as the literary motif of the doppelganger as an inveterate performer of identity. 
In this context, I critique data power in, in part through Poster's notion of the database as this perfect writing machine that amplifies the power and control of its owner user by generating our other selves. However, Poster's perfect writing machine is only a starting point. In what follows, I offer a short history of the doppelganger and its connection to themes of disruption, disorder, difference, and repetition, arguing that the data doppelganger is a more productive constituent through which to critique data power. I then discuss the role of databases as part of data infrastructure and explore new avenues for thinking with Poster's original databases discourse. So, the doppelganger. The notion of a double or doppelganger has, in the course of the last five centuries, become a well-worked literary motif that troubles identity, indifference, certainty, and ambiguity. Doubles, twins, self-division, and duplication inhabits the rich landscape of traditional storytelling and mythology in many different cultures, long before becoming a fascination in the romantic era of the 19th century. Across many fictional accounts from old to new, the doppelganger is often portrayed as a negative or evil entity through which hostile actions are ascribed to a foreign self performed by proxy. By the 19th century, the doppelganger had assumed a gothic quality, reflecting the fascination authors such as Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, E.T.A. Hoffman, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Mary Wollstonecroft. Shelley had with doubles in parallel with their preoccupation with life and vitalism, including the vivified, the reanimated, and the alienated. The double is prevalent, too, within Freudian psychoanalysis and studies of the self within the self and the idea of the uncanny and the abject. The uncanny, of course, is Freud's explanation for the occurrence of the familiar within something that the unfamiliar within something that should be familiar, such as being started by one's own appearance in a mirror. The otherness wrought by the doppelganger presents a challenge to the rational centered self, highlighting a tension between division and unity. And I'll argue that the data of doppelganger can be just as unsettling. The data doppelganger has a generative power and is full of potentiality. The profiled bank customer is denied a mortgage or the tracked and analyzed consumer is offered a deal on their favorite brands on their recent based on their recent pur purchases. The data doppelganger is a proximal body that can do something in the context of decision-making apparatus such as Amazon's recommendation system. And in that context, the data doppelganger can act to trigger particular kinds of suggestions for our consumer self by merging our past actions and choices with our many similes within an aggregated corpus of data to which we are compared. In this way, our data doppelganger reflects what Andrew Weber calls the performative character of the doppelganger engaged in enactments of identity, whereby each iteration, each new self, enacts consequential outcomes for the individual. The data doppelganger is also in kinship with the data double of the surveillance assemblage. And as my co-panelist also noted, the surveillance assemblage is operating to abstract human bodies from their territorial set settings separating them into discrete series of flows, which are reassembled into data doubles for the purposes of profiling. The surveillance assemblage conveys the force and flow of a convergent stream of data about individuals and things that grows ever larger today. The data double of 15 years ago when Haggerty and Erickson were first writing is now the bloated doppelganger of consumer surveillance and digital culture a constellation of performative affect, communicative practice, and digital tracking that doubles down on consumer identity and activity from purchases to searches to tweets and deletes. The idea of a double or copy, however, is problematic, and I'll, I'll come back to that notion in a moment. By now, most of us know Gilles Deleuze theorized societies of control, following what Foucault called the disciplinary society, by describing a shift from spaces of confinement and enclosure to continuous modulating control by coder software. In the present moment, it's no longer the value of the reflexive individual, the person. Rather, it is the value in the data produced by and about the individual, what Deleuze called in that piece a multiplicity of individuals. So these are the myriad data points which are stored in databases and circulate in information flows. But the database has been crucial to the collection and storage of data since the 1960s, but long before that, the list form clearly served as the organization and structure of information in antiquity preceding the database by several thousand of years. Databases are carefully arranged lists, when you think about it, separated into tables with grids of specification. Now, this is in part Poster's argument to consider this discourse following Foucault's rules of formation for discourse. 
Paul Durich argues databases make the world as material assemblages that combine software, hardware, and data, and I would add, people, pro practices, and processes, and are a prolific part of communication and media infrastructure. Databases, then, are a framework for object relations, but knowledge in this context is a database of representations, which can be translated into language to describe a person, place, or thing. This, in many ways, again, is the point of Poster's work through the 1990s to argue that the mode of information and its incorporation in databases has a powerful decentering effect on the individual. Databases, according to Poster, are writing at the border of subject and object, and representations of the individual are neither solid nor stable, but rather an unsettling simulation of unity because they draw on disparate data to manufacture the profile. Poster extends proposed panoptic model, therefore, of surveillance by an order of magnitude, coupling the circuits of communication to the databases now required for intensive, intensive information gathering. Poster's databases discourse, understood as a perfect writing machine, describes the logic embedded in databases and its ability to write out identity facts from discrete personal facts captured and stored as data. Individuals can imagine how they might be profiled, but they cannot know precisely how personal facts are mapped within a profile generated by databases. The process is, for the most part, incomprehensible to the individual, and yet, in spite of the lack of transparency, individuals are, in effect, recruited into an understanding of themselves as data patterns. A set of clustered facts, a light patterning of similarity, stands in for them during important life calculations and decisions, from whether they get a bank loan to an assessment for insurance. This is the data doppelganger that emerges from the database, often fleetingly, in a moment of record that serves to abstract the individual from their material surroundings. It points to Poster's construction of databases as nothing but performative machines, engines for producing retrievable identities. It is for these reasons that I summon the doppelganger as the constituent of the data assemblage. While the idea of a data double is a persistent and frequent construct in surveillance studies and data studies, what is ironic is that the digital double is no such thing. It is neither a copy nor a double, and in no way identical to the flesh and blood reflexive person. Instead, what you have in the idea of a double in this context is a semblance of familiarity best ascribed to a doppelganger. A digital self that looks and feels familiar but can in fact perform quite differently depending on what data is used to construct it. The data assemblage produces a vital and changeable data doppelganger. It has an assortment of data that is extracted from the database and assembled in a profile, but which is never an identical copy of the person. It is the simulacrum. The doppelganger doesn't spring from a grounded origin. It emanates and propagates from a continuously variable data set from any number of databases. The data assemblage thus brings a new kind of power, data power in which knowledge is not produced about the world anymore, but from the world. Poster suggests postmodern culture configures multiple dispersed subject positions, whose domination no longer is affected by alienated power, but by entirely new articulations of technologies of power. The database is new and improved in today's accretive data assemblage that grows ever larger and processes of segmentation operate to continuously divide the reflexive individual into ever smaller slices or data points. Folds, connections, articulations, and attenuations, all part of an incessant modulation producing codified belonging. That is, of belonging in a fleeting instant to a category or a class to form what Deleuze and Guattari call a compact structure as a profiled subject to ensure and control the identity of each agency, including personal identity. Antoinette Rufoy reconfigures profiling as data brief behaviorism because as a process, it collects, selects, and analyzes data about people and process and produces statistical bodies that can be acted on by simulating future behavior and exercising preemptive power over the profile. I would argue this data behaviorism has an algorithmic vitality an emergent dynamic as a constellation of forces as part of and within the data as assemblage that constructs a new truth regime based on algorithmic reason intended to help private companies and governments anticipate what individuals could or may do in the future. 
The new articulations of power are combinatorial. Databases and the sense-making apparatus exercised through the analytical powers of the algorithm is at the same time a more perfect regime of visibility and intelligibility. In this new regime of power, Scott Lash reminds us, the structures of discourse have been displaced by structures of information in the knowledge power relation. Data doppelgangers are not subjects of discourse. They are proximal objects, a proxy on whose silicon body of data are inscribed facts, indicia, details, habits, records of past actions and choices, which functions within an anticipatory apparatus. So whether we look into the cloud or into the wires, it's doppelgangers all the way down. Thank you.